is a joy as well to call you friend. Many of you do not know me, so I wanted to open by telling you something a little bit personal about myself, though Maria filled you in somewhat. You see, I am a preacher's kid. And growing up, my siblings and I had this unusual theory. Well, how many of you here are preacher's kids? Maybe you can relate to this theory, but we had this theory. We believed that preacher's kids fell into two categories. There were the studious nerds who followed all the rules, and then there were those who were rebellious. And the five kids in my family were determined to fall in the latter category. Now, I won't go into the details, but suffice it to say, there was involvement, lots of involvement with religious school principals. There was lots of involvement with secular school principals and far beyond. You see, preacher's kids have a reputation for getting into trouble. And let me tell you why. A lot is expected of them. But now the tables have turned and I am no longer a preacher's kid. I am a preacher. And so now I expect a lot not only from my own two children, but I expect a lot from my congregations and my congregants' children, and I expect a lot from all children of faith. You see, in Charlotte and in society, I believe that we have set our standards too low. And we expect too little from ourselves and from our communities, from our congregations, and from our government. We have become far too accustomed to the inequities and to the iniquities of our world. Let me tell you something else about being a preacher and about being a preacher's kid. Thanksgiving was and Thanksgiving continues to be one of my favorite holidays. Because growing up, I did not need to share my father with any congregation. Because Thanksgiving does not belong to any one faith. Not to the Jewish faith, or Christian, or Islamic faith, or Buddhist, or Baha'i, or Hindu faith. Thanksgiving belongs to us all. As a Charlotte community, and as a family of co-mingled faiths, we have been blessed with a very rich harvest. Our Queen City is gleaming with growth. And just as preachers have great expectations of their parishioners, and just as parents have high expectations of their children, so does God on Thanksgiving place great demands upon us. According to scripture, when we celebrate our times of thanksgiving, God expects three essential tasks from us. God expects us to be grateful for what we have. God expects us to recall our journey to this moment. And God expects us to share our plenty. Now, our first goal on this day of being Thankful for what we have sounds like an easy enough task, but I assure you it is not. The legend is told of God sending out angels to gather the complaints of the people, and the angels went throughout the world and their baskets came back overflowing. Human beings were so unhappy, they had so many complaints. Imagine that, Dr. Gorman. <laughs> And then the angels were sent on a second mission to gather the thanks of the people. And this time the angels scoured the earth and passed by every land and every living soul. But their mission was disappointingly fruitless. Their baskets came back empty. As human beings, we have this fundamental flaw. We see the bad more readily than we see the good. We complain more than we offer gratitude. Robert Louis Stevenson once observed that the person who has forgotten to be thankful has fallen asleep in the midst of life. While most of us are sleep deprived, we are too physically tired and we are too spiritually disconnected to recognize the blessings 
that surround us. And we're not the only generation to sleepwalk through the miracles of life. There is a legend told, a popular legend on the story of Exodus, that explains that as the Israelites were crossing the sea to freedom, some of those Israelites completely missed the miracle of the parting sea. You see, when the sea parted, there was mud on the ground. And some of the Israelites couldn't get their eyes away from the mud, and they started to complain. They said, look at this mud. It is ruining my shoes. <laughs> it is so difficult to walk in, they said. What type of leadership is this? We would have been better off to have stayed in Egypt. Those Israelites became so focused on the mud that they failed to lift their eyes, to look up and see the greatest miracle that was all around them. There are two types of people in this world. There are those who think that they don't have enough, enough time, enough money, enough resources, enough friends. And so they walk around the earth angry and resentful with their eyes glued to the ground, sharing their discontent with everyone they encounter. And then there are other people who even in the midst of life's greatest adversity, who feel blessed, who feel that they have enough, more than enough. And because they do, they feel compelled not to take more, but to give. On this week of Thanksgiving, God wants us to be the latter type of people. God enjoins us to look up from our overscheduled and our heavily burdened lives and to get our mind and our eyes unstuck from the mud of life's daily tasks. Our 10th commandment enjoins us not to covet. It enjoins us to be happy with what we have. It enjoins us to say thank you to God and to others for our food, for our shelter, for our health, for our bodies, for our minds, and for our souls. <clears throat> the second task that God demands of us on this day is to remember our past. The book of Deuteronomy teaches that when things are good, when we come into the land, when we till our soil and plant our seeds, when we harvest our fruits, we need to remember our history. Scripture teaches that we cannot possibly appreciate where we are without remembering from where we have come. So what is our history as a queen city? We have clearly grown in numbers. When this interfaith service was first convened 31 years ago, Mecklenburg County had 350,000 residents. Today, that number has nearly doubled, and that's just Mecklenburg County, not the greater city area. And as we, as we have grown in population, we have grown in stature. People are moving to Charlotte in droves because of our city's beauty, because of its climate, because of its culture, because of its economic stability. Though CMS, our Charlotte Mecklenburg school system, certainly has its challenges, we have one of the best urban school districts in the country, and we have great centers of higher learning. Davidson, UNCC, Johnson C. Smith University, Queens, Johnson, and Wales. We have a vibrant business community that gives our city of Charlotte a great name across the globe. And as is evidence today, we have a flourishing religious community. We have 700 houses of worship in our city, with our citizens attending worship, with 50% of our citizens attending worship weekly. Yet sadly, as we have grown, we have also grown apart. We are high on the scale of philanthropy and religiosity, but we are shamefully low on the scale of racial trust. 
We do not know one another well, and in many cases, we do not know one another at all. Apart from today, we do not pray together. Our Sabbaths, whether they fall on Friday or Saturday or Sunday, are the most segregated day of the week. In our local legislation, we do not create policies that support each other, and we do not create policies that support all. According to Thomas Hanchett in his book, Sorting Out the New South City, over the past century, Charlotte has changed from a place where people of all types lived intermingled throughout the town to a southern city sorted out, first into a patchwork of well-defined neighborhoods, and then into groups of neighborhoods demarcated by color and by class. Instead of growing closer to one another, we have grown increasingly distant. As I mentioned, I am a preacher's kid, and I was taught by my siblings to cause trouble. <laughs> but growing up, and as a teenager, the trouble that I stirred was for no good cause. But tonight, I, enjoy, I join and invite all of you to join me in causing trouble by challenging the systems in our city and county and calling for change. Tonight, we need to cause trouble by complaining loudly about the insufficiencies of low-income housing, about the inequities of education, about the injustices of our health care system that denies support to those who need it most, the hourly worker who cannot afford to pay for it, we need to protest passionately about the lack of racial trust in this city. And together, we need to denounce the increasing violence that plagues our city and takes the lives night after night of our innocent youth. As a religious community, we are the jewel in the crown of this queen city. But we are not meant to be ornaments shining in prayer behind our stained glass windows. We are meant to be instruments of change. Yes. So I pray that the history that we will recall at future Thanksgiving services will reflect the work we will have done in bridging the unbearable educational and socioeconomic gaps that exist in our city so that everyone in our city will have reason to rejoice if we work together to improve housing and health care and education and livable wages, then we will indeed create a queen city that is worthy of a royal reputation. The final task that God asks of us on this day is to share our plenty. All of you in coming here tonight recognize that Thanksgiving is not about satisfying our own hunger, or not just about satisfying our own hunger, though the turkey is wonderful. But this holiday is about satisfying the hunger of others. And through that process, we satisfy our hunger to make a difference and to make meaning of our lives. The most important part of this Thanksgiving holiday is not just about gratitude. It is about the giving. Now, there are so many stories that make this point, but one of my favorite comes from Chicken Soup for the Soul. And it's a story of a little boy named Chad who had little, but he knew the value of giving. And his mother tells this heartbreaking and at the same time heartwarming story of her son Chad who was a quiet and shy boy. And it was three weeks before Valentine's Day when he told his mother that he wanted to make a Valentine for every kid in his class. Well, his mother's heart sank because this little boy was unpopular. And she was afraid that he'd be hurt, that he'd give all these cards and get none in return. But she went along with the plan. And she bought him the glue and the crayons and the paper. And for three weeks, night after night, Chad painstakingly made 35 Valentines. 
And on Valentine's Day, when it dawned, he was beside himself with excitement. He stacked up the cards, he put them in his backpack, and he bolted at the door. And his mom feared that he'd be disappointed, so she made him his favorite chocolate chip cookies to soften the blood when he would get home. And that afternoon, she heard the children outside as usual. They were laughing and having a great time. And there was Chad, as always, in the back of the group. And he was walking a little slower than usual. And she was worried that he'd break into tears the minute he got in the door. And she noticed his hands were empty. And when the door opened, she choked, she, she choked back her tears. She said, Mommy has some cookies and milk for you. But Chad hardly heard her words. He just walked on by, his face aglow, and all he could say was, not a one. Not a one. Her heart sank. And then he said, I didn't forget one. Not a single one. <laughs> the essence of this Thanksgiving Day is giving thanks not only through our feelings of appreciation, but giving thanks through our actions, on this day and every day, like this little boy in the story, let us focus not on what we hold in our hands, but on what we have given to others. May we be sure as a community to give to all an equal opportunity for survival and for success in our city on this day, and on this holiday week, and in this year, and in our city, let us not forget one. Let us not forget a single one. Not an adult, not a child, not a lonely, nor hungry, nor saddened soul who dwells in our midst. Amen.